me $90 billion worth of highways. Build me more giant shopping centers. Tear down the ugly old parts of my city. Build me a thousand modern office buildings. Connect the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean. Turn deserts into rich farmlands. Build a million new homes this year. And about seven million automobiles. And you better hurry with our school. I want my children to have a college education. Let's have planes that will fly many times the speed of sound. And by the way, keep going on those rockets. Build them bigger and build them faster. We want to do more than hit the moon. We want to land there and look around. We have big wants in this big country, but who are we? What do we produce? What kind of jobs do we have? And what are we building? The paperwork involved in answering these and many other questions asked in the United States census taking resulted in a veritable snowstorm. In the 1960 census, then came UNIVAC. This one at the University of North Carolina helped the Census Bureau cut processing time from many months to a few weeks. Other great projects, such as designing and building a nuclear submarine that could circle the globe submerged, would have been practically impossible without a computer. Navigating in the eerie, starless world under the polar ice cap requires tools to free men's minds. Designing, building, and tracking a satellite in orbit without a computer. In fact, a series of specialized computers, each doing a specific job, would be something like trying to dig the St. Lawrence Seaway with a hand shovel. Actually, we're moving so fast, building so much, producing so much, that progress would be choked by paperwork if the electronic breakthrough hadn't occurred just when it did. Less than 15 years ago, the eckert mockley team ushered in the electronic computer age with ENIAC. More than 18,000 electronic tubes and many miles of wire were strung together with the bold imagination and mathematical genius. ENIAC's first job was at the Aberdeen Proving Ground, solving a knotty problem in nuclear physics. The machine blinked and buzzed only two hours on that first assignment, but programming the data into the computer took nearly two weeks. Solution by conventional methods would have kept an engineer busy with his slide rule and pencil for a hundred years, a full century. In reality, the problem might have been solved by a hundred engineers working for one year. The Finac, the second member in the Univac family, was introduced. Although it employed electronic tubes to amplify the pulses racing through its great mass of circuitry, it did use some solid-state devices, which made it a proving ground for the fully solid-state computers that were to come later. Vinac, designed to solve engineering equations, was actually two identical computers, one checking the other. The dynamic mercury memory system was used in this computer for the first time. Then came UNIVAC. This was more than a computer. It was a business data processing system. The UNIVAC series of computers were the first large-scale systems made practical for commercial application. They were the first computing systems to use parallel methods of operation. Magnetic tape was incorporated in the system to add to the wide range of flexible input and output devices. This was followed by the announcement of the first card-to-tape converter, making older equipment more compatible with the newer data processing systems. Remington Rand was the first to employ coincident current core memory that has since become standard on electronic computer systems. 
During the next three years, UNIVAC developed several classified computers for the armed forces. The trend in this development was towards smaller and smaller components. From this research came the Faractor, a memory component so small that it had to be assembled under a microscope. This exclusive UNIVAC development replaced bulky vacuum tubes and led directly to the first fully solid state computer. The advanced Navy computer, the Nike Zeus target intercept computer, and the Athena are typical of these pioneer solid state computers. They were fast, efficient, and extremely reliable. The Athena is used in solving missile guidance problems with amazing reliability and accuracy. Our first weather satellite, Tyros, owed its precise orbit to the Athena. The experience and production know-how acquired in the development of these military computers led to another UNIVAC first in the commercial field. The UNIVAC solid-state computer installed in 1958 at the Dresdner Bank in Hamburg, Germany, represented a major engineering breakthrough a bold new concept of business data processing in smaller, less expensive packages with less maintenance and more processing with higher reliability. This new generation of powerful, compact, univac solid-state computers employs the latest electronic components and circuitry. Comparing these components to an ordinary pencil eraser dramatizes the modern trend towards solid-state miniaturization. Through space-age research, a number of new computer techniques have been developed. Highly reliable components, character amplifiers, transistors, and easily replaceable printed circuit cards. Unmatched versatility, simultaneous read-write, print, punch, and compute operations. Compatibility, programmers can use any type input code with a variety of output media metallic or plastic tape, punched cards, and printed hard copies. In 1959, the Livermore Advanced Research Computer was offered to the business world. LARC, as it is now called, was originally built to the specifications of the Atomic Energy Commission's Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, operated by the University of California at Livermore. The second LARC was built for the Bureau of Ships, United States Navy. Here is a totally new input concept, a drum that supplements conventional tape units. Operating in the 370 kilocycle range, the new drum is far faster than any tape units made or anticipated. Lark's circuitry, operating in the 500 nanosecond range, is supported by a massive modular core memory composed of hundreds of core planes. The processor is the outstanding feature of the LARC, actually another computer which allows all peripheral equipment to operate while the machine is computing. Final information is printed online by the page recorder at speeds measured in pages per second instead of lines per minute. LARC's prodigious capabilities provide the greatest amount of data processing for the least amount of money. From LARC's design came UNIVAC 3, which represents the most advanced step in computer technology in the last decade. Pioneering is one thing, but staying in the lead of a new industry that promises to expand ever more rapidly demands tremendous physical and human resources. Behind Remington Rand Univac is the Sperry Rand Corporation with 85 manufacturing plants throughout the world, producing more than a billion dollars worth of products annually. The Sperry Gyroscope Division with its vast engineering and manufacturing resources is closely related to Univac. Sperry, for instance, produced the inertial flight data system for the X-15 research aircraft to carry man on his first venture into outer space. It was designed with the help of electronic computers pioneered by Remington Rand engineers. The Ford Instrument Division is another producer of highly specialized electronic equipment. For example, this programming device for the guidance system in the Redstone missile was miniaturized in stages for the more sophisticated Jupiter.
The engineering talents at Ford Instrument are in the same family of talents that keep UNIVAC ahead. The Vickers division of the Sperry Rand family is best known as the world's largest producer of hydraulic equipment to control the power of the machines of modern industry. However, nuclear submarines are made magnetically invisible to the enemy by the talents of the Electric Products Division of Vickers Incorporated. This vast pool of experience and capability, represented by the engineering and research staffs of the many divisions of the Sperry Rand Corporation, is constantly available to the men who design and build our most advanced electronic computers. Computers extend men's minds, multiply thought, give the human brain millions of hands to speed its work. But since no machine can think, great opportunity and sharp challenge lie in devising better ways to use electronic computers. Instead of a special computer language used in the past, English language programming now allows the operator to instruct his machine in familiar phrases. This development saves programming time and gives management new understanding and control of data processing. These pioneering names made computer history. Direct descendants of these early breakthroughs continue to make news in the data processing field. Backed by its distinguished teammates, the UNIVAC division will continue to lead the field. Mr. J.P. Ecker, chief engineer of the original ENIAC project, is today designing computers with hundreds of times the speed and capacity of his pioneer machine that ushered in the computer age. Mr. Eckert, will the next generation of computers be larger and faster than those we have today? Well, I wouldn't say that they will be larger, but they will certainly be faster. At least the elements from which the computers are made will be faster. Uh, when we first started building computers, many years ago, we used to speak of milliseconds or a thousandth of a second. Then as we got into vacuum tube computers and various types of solid state computers and transistors, we used microseconds and fractions of microseconds. Now that we've got into tech, gone into technologies which use thin films and which use tunnel diodes and some of the newer elements, we are starting to deal with millimicroseconds, which is a billionth of a second. The, uh, the millimicrosecond has, uh, has also been, uh, been called a nanosecond. Uh, nanosecond, spelled N-A-N-O-S-E-C-O-N-D, which is a billionth of a second. Now, I say our computers will be smaller for two reasons. One is we're trying to find ways to make them less expensively by processes in which we evaporate through masks, like printing. And this makes them smaller. And secondly, we've, we've about reached the relativistic limits in our present computers. In the Lark, for example, about 10% of the time is used just to get the signals from one place to the other, because in a nanosecond, electricity can only travel about less than a foot over a wire. Therefore, if we're going to build faster machines than Lark, we must build them smaller. Now, the thin films lend themselves to smallness in many ways. A memory array in a present computer might be as big as shown in this picture and might hold a few thousand bits or pieces of information. A thin film memory which consists of metal strips evaporated on a glass or metal base uh, at right angles, and with small islands, as I have shown on the blackboard here, might for, uh, for an array of 25 of these islands only be a tenth of an inch square. And indeed, as many bits are as held in a regular memory array the size of this piece of paper, 
might be held on something less than the size of a postage stamp. These films are also very thin. If, uh, if a human hair were as thick as this blackboard is high, the films we're talking about would only be as thick as the chalk line I have drawn. Uh, these films range from a hundredth as thick as a human hair to about a ten thousandth as thick as the human hair in the case of uh, certain cryogenic films that we've run tests on. Now, the small elements, aside from giving us high speed and low cost, are not the only small items that we are concerned with in modern computer thinking. We have worried a great deal about the techniques for recording information. On a punch card, which is a little larger than this, we, re we punch about a thousand holes, or about 50 holes per square inch. On magnetic tapes in machines you have seen earlier in this film, we record up to 10,000 uh, bits or impulses per square inch. We are now working on magnetic tapes and on various optical recording means in which 100,000 bits and maybe even over a million bits will be recorded per square inch. On uh, these uh, newer methods of recording may not be applied to uh, tapes. They may be applied to large drums or to sets of rotating discs or to other shapes. Now, what is the real end purpose, however, of all this speed and all this cost reduction? Well, the real purpose of building smaller, faster, and less expensive computers is to try to make machines which are more flexible and more general purpose in their ability. Now, by machines, I do not just mean computing machines as we view them today, but I mean machines which do things. In the past, most of our machines have either been very special purpose, such as a machine to completely make automatically a cigarette, or in the case of machines which have been general purpose, such as in a lathe, a great deal of tension and operation and control by a human operator was still required. Now, with the event of low cost and extremely high speed computers, and furthermore, computers with a high memory capacity, it will be possible for machines to take over many of the boring and repetitive tasks which are properly the work of machines. And human beings will, will then be left to use their creative ability to make use of the fruits of this more productive society. Although computer progress has been amazingly...